Welcome to Mission to Inspire, where we share life experiences in our careers, personal lives, society, culture, religion, finance, family, and much more. Meet your host, Shola Ajabadi, as she takes you on a ride to fuel your inspiration. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to Mission to Inspire. My name is Shola, and we've got our wonderful guest here with us today. Her name is Deb Brown Mayer. Hi, Deb. Hi, Shola. Hello, audience. Good to be with you all. <laughs> nice to have you on our show today. And we'll be discussing a very unique topic, actually. Um, unique because it's it's something that we know. Um, but not the way we know it. <laughs> That's what I'll say <laughs> for now. So meet Deb Brown. Um, she's a remarkable sales coach and author. Um, who didn't initially chose sales as a preferred career path? However, instead of resorting to high pressure sales tactics. She was determined to find a better way and turn to the leadership example of Jesus. So she shares a profound insight in her book and video training program, Sell Like Jesus, the seven characteristics of Christ for ethical sales, emphasizing the importance of caring for others while achieving win-win results. So that's what we are going to be talking about today sell like jesus so you see it's something we know about but in a very unique way <laughs> very much so <laughs> before we dive into today's topic we're going to ask you some few questions um that relate to you so it's a decent okay. question and uh, we want you to honestly answer them sure <laughs> okay so the first question is Teaching sales techniques or ethical principles? Well, they are both vital, but I would say ethical sales principles first because values and beliefs drive yeah. what we do. And techniques are the things that we do and how we do them. So if we're doing the technique with the wrong motive, we're yeah. not going to get the best result. Oh, okay. Wow. That's good to know. <laughs> I know you're artistic. So find yes. out painting or writing books. You do both. Painting uh -huh. by far. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, wow. So I've been painting much longer than I've been writing. I started when I was five. Wow. So it's it's very much a part of me. Mm. And color brings me joy. Um, writing is something I had to learn to well, do okay. and to do well. Mm -hmm. So it's writing represents more work. Art represents more fun. Oh, Although no. writing can be fun too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But I'm sure you can combine both. And you do combine both. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I know you're a fun lover of pets. So, cats or dogs? Oh, cats. cats. <laughs> Sorry, dog lovers. <laughs> I respect you. I think it's great that you love your dog. But yeah. I want nothing you to do with cat. dogs. <laughs> I've never owned a dog. Don't want to own a dog. Yeah, cats. Cats. Okay. Um, finding inspiration from Jesus leadership or other historical figures. Uh, I'm sorry, what was the second? Finding inspiration from Jesus leadership or historical figures, other historical figures. Hmm. I would say finding inspiration from Jesus' leadership. Um, it's an inexhaustible subject. Right. And 
there always seem to be more layers, no matter how many times I go back and re-study familiar scripture passages. Right. And of course, as I'm in different situations, I'm challenged differently to handle things and to do them well. So yeah, <laughs> that would be so there. That's not surprising anyway, because the inspiration about your book is similar. Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. No surprise. Not a surprise. Yeah. Lastly, shortening the learning curve for sales professionals or helping them achieve exceptional results. I would say shortening the learning curve because the more effective they are, yeah. the more quickly the results will follow. That's true. So the results are going to be the natural outcome of shifting gears and doing behaviors that are more consistent with success. Success. Wow. Thank you so much. We feel that we know you now. <laughs> we know you better. <laughs> Thank you for answering those questions. So today's topic is selling with integrity, incorporating Christian principles into sales. So we will actually be exploring how to sell like Jesus, which is the title of a book and training, um, emphasizing ethical and compassionate sales practices inspired by Christian principles. So I'm going to leave it to Deb. Um, so she's going to tell us about herself and why she's approached to sales, emphasizing, incorporating Christian principles into, into the process. So I'm going to leave that to you. Very good. Thank you. Um, Jesus is all about love and it is going to sound a little bit weird, so bear with me, but I'm going to say that when we approach people with love in our heart, mm. even if it's a sales call, right. then right. we're going to treat them differently than if we're trying to get something from them. Mm. So... um the reason that I ended up writing this book, and it, it it really wasn't my idea. I felt like God called me to do it because there is, I could not find another book for sale yeah. that talked about incorporating Christian values into the sales process. Now, since I wrote it, I found a couple others but there aren't a lot. It's not a popular topic. Mm -hmm. And in fact, when I told people the title, I got a lot of flack. You know, they said things like, well, Jesus didn't sell anything. He gave everything. Well, bear with me. Let me explain what I'm talking about here. I'm, I'm looking at how he did what he did to gain followers that has lasted for 2,000 years or more, and then applying those same principles, concepts, and strategies in the marketplace. So I, for myself, because I ended up in sales jobs after getting a, a four-year college degree in Latin American studies that really didn't give me a whole lot of work skills per se. Um, I ended up in sales jobs and was very uncomfortable at the way I was being asked to sell. And the more people I talked to, especially solo entrepreneurs, freelancers, yeah. small yeah. business owners who have to have a hand in sales, almost every single one says, I hate sales. It's a necessary evil. Ouch. Oh, if you hate sales, how are you going to generate revenue? If you hate sales, you are naturally going to avoid doing sales activities because you'd rather be doing 
all the other things that you love about your business. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, you know, people got into business because they're passionate about the product or service that they bring to society, not because they wanted to be good at sales. Mm -hmm. So most, you know, I, the statistics, it depends on what group you look at, but uh, the most popular that I've seen is most small businesses will fail within the first year. Like, I think it's 90%. And another 90% of those mm -hmm. will fail within the first five years. Wow. That's a really horrible track record. Yes, it is. Yeah. But I think I know why. It's because most people avoid sales. Yes. So what if sales could be maybe not fun, but not like poking a stick in your eye? What if you could find some level of peace and a sense of accomplishment when you do the actions that it takes in order to sell so that you can stay in business and continue to do what you're passionate about. Mm -hmm. So that's that's what really drove me to write the book because here locally working with companies in person, working with individuals or in small group training, I can only reach hundreds in my career span. But with the book, I can reach potentially millions yeah. and I can reach around the world. Yeah. So even right now, I'm in Pennsylvania. You're in England. Yes, that's true. And, and, and the world has gotten so much smaller because of this technology. So <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a little bit of the background of why I ended up doing uh, why the book. You wrote the book. Okay, thank you so much for that. So in your book and video training program, um, Sell Like Jesus, um, the seven characteristics of Christ for ethical sales, you discuss the importance of empathy and caring for others in sales. Yes. So um, how do you ensure that these values remain at the forefront of our sales coaching Great question. So empathy is not the same as sympathy. I need to make that clear first. Yeah. Empathy is aligning with someone else's feelings. It doesn't mean you, it doesn't mean you've had to feel the same way they have. It doesn't mean you've had to go through the same things that they've gone through. It simply means that you're listening and you're taking into account their emotional perspective mm -hmm. as you have your conversation. That if you're coming at the sales conversation from a position of empathy, then you're looking to understand the other person as well as possible in the context of this potential working together. Right. So understanding what is it that caused them to be looking for a solution? Why now? What's been going on? What changed? Yeah. How have they tried to fix this in the past? And how did that work? Or maybe it didn't work, which is why they're talking to you now. Being curious to ask those kinds of questions, yeah. they, they show the other person that you really care about them, their situation, and them getting a solution to their problem. Yeah, Because that's really what we buy. We, we buy solutions to problems. That's very true. We buy solutions to problems. We're always looking for solutions anyway. That's the ultimate. <laughs> yeah. 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 We're always looking for solutions. So balancing sales targets and ethical practices can be challenging, as you know. So how yes. do you guide your clients in achieving their sales goals? 
Yeah, so um, there are some easy ways to be taken off the path. It's to to kind of leave things out mm -hmm. in order to paint a better picture yeah. or over promise and then go back to the office and bug the development team and say, okay, guys, you got to do it this way. And, that, and now everybody at the office is mad at you because you promised something and now they have to work harder, right? Yeah. All of, it's, it's very tempting when you're in that sales role to want to please to your own or your company's detriment. Yeah. So first thing is be aware of those temptations. Mm. second is have some rules that you do not break and then have some language to explain why you're not going to break your rules let me give you an example yeah let's let's say i'm selling computers uh, laptops mm -hmm. and someone wants a laptop top with a purple exterior and we don't have those so I have a choice I can say I'll figure it out I'll get I'll find someone who's got a purple one and it doesn't matter I'll, so now I'm going to run myself ragged and trying to fulfill something that isn't part of the norm yeah so my rule is I only have the, these colors and that's what I can offer. So when someone asks me for purple and I don't have it, what yeah. am I going to say? What am I going to say to, to maintain rapport and continue to be empathetic? Mm. So it, I teach folks how to script is probably too strong a word, but have a way of saying things that you've probably practiced because it's not going to come out naturally it goes something like this i would love to get that for you in purple unfortunately it's not one of the colors that's available okay. what i do have is pink or this lovely shade of blue which kind of has a purple hue to it would either of those work for you hmm. so let me break down the structure of what i did there because there's a structure behind it. So you can learn the structure and apply it no matter what the circumstance. So here's the structure. Acknowledge what they're asking for. I would love to get that for you in purple, but very quickly turn the corner to state the truth. The truth is I don't have it. And I, I, I refuse to promise you something I probably can't get. Then the next step is offer an alternative. Mm. So it isn't just, no, I can't get that for you in purple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now the customer is getting upset. But because I said, love to get it in purple, I keep asking them to do that, but we don't have it yet. So we do have this or this. Would either of those be okay with you? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And now I'm, I'm staying engaged. I'm coming back. I'm not saying we have this or this. Yeah, yeah. I'm saying this is what we do have. Would that would? Can you agree to one of those? Now it's their choice. Mm -hmm. So you, this is a whole combination of mindset that's driving my actions. Mm -hmm. It's a structured approach to doing it, yeah. and. It's Empathy, empathy because i'm I, I wish i could give you what you want but i'm i'm not gonna promise something i can't deliver now when i'm honest ironically because we don't see it this way until we really analyze it it isn't really ironic the mm -hmm. truth is that i build trust by being honest and not giving somebody what they asked for mm, mm, right yes mm. so we're stuck in our head thinking the only way to please the other person is to give them what they ask for That's, no, mm. no. It, well, it's 
Isn't that interesting how you actually have a much better opportunity to show your trustworthiness, show it mm -hmm. versus, hey, trust me, I'll get you the best deal possible. <laughs> Yuck. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to sound like that. Mm -hmm. But I know I'm trustworthy. And that builds relationships. Mm, that's true that's very true very true wow thank you for that one thing that we've actually um noticed about a lot of sales representations is that they don't say the truth most of the time <laughs> yeah yes that's the thing they don't say the truth most of the time so your approach is really good it's really subtle um yeah and it, it it kind of calms that customer down as well <laughs> the way you yes know. yeah yeah exactly yeah and it keeps things conversational mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and and it keeps them on the um it, it keeps them relational instead of transactional is very true yes yes indeed. and that's that is a key we we do not want to be transactional mm -hmm. um now there are plenty of sales that are made through transactions lots of stuff is done without ever talking to someone obviously here we're talking about cases where you're selling the kind of product or service that you really need a dialogue with your buyer it's very hard for them to self-serve without hearing from you because uh, your product is more complex. There are multiple options. There are multiple layers. Mm -hmm. Lots of reasons why actually engaging in a conversation is going to get both buyer and seller a much better result than just doing a transaction without that connection yeah, because... Cool. I don't know, as a buyer, I don't know what I don't know, yeah. right? I know it sounds stupid, but, <laughs> but it's true. It's very true. Very so true. A, a good salesperson is going to ask the questions to make me think about things I didn't even realize were important. Important, yes. Mm. And that shows their value to me as the buyer. And again, it builds trust. When a, when a salesperson asks me something that I don't have a ready answer for, I'm always appreciative because I know they're pointing something out that I hadn't considered. considered. Okay. And by considering it, I can make a much better decision. Mm. That's very true. That's right. And, and, it, and it actually creates a relationship because that customer might come back to that store and be looking for that particular um, yeah. sales representative because of the experience they had the first time. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's very true. Wow. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. <laughs> You're welcome. So, um, you know, that selling can sometimes be associated with aggressive tactics. So you've actually touched on that already. Um, yeah. How do you then coach sales personnel to be assertive yet compassionate? So um, I know you've touched on it, but if you can just elaborate a little bit more. So um, assertive, not aggressive. Mm. Knowing when to stand your ground and when, how to recognize when it's not going to be good for both parties. Okay. So most um, high pressure sales tactics mm -hmm. are geared towards get the yes, get the yes, collect yeses, get them to say yes. The more they say yes, the more likely they are to buy. Sorry, we all see through it, but here's the problem. We still buy from people who do that. And <laughs> We buy from them because we don't have another option yeah. or because of timing, it's expedient mm -hmm. or because we get caught up in the emotion of the moment and we say yes. And then they leave and we go, oh my gosh, what did I just do? Maybe I can cancel. Yes, <laughs> that's happened to me several times. <laughs> 
So the the high pressure gets more back outs because yeah. what is happening? High pressure sales banks on selling to your emotion. Right. Okay. While they're emotionally charged. Mm. Ethical sales never sells on emotion. Ooh. Emotion is part of it. It's a very important part of it because it drives the decision. Right. But budget and the decision making process both have to be considered. And those are the logical side of buying. Right. So the is, I, I got to get this problem fixed. The sooner the better. Right. But I got to pay for it. I have to have the money in the bank. I have to make sure that when I change these things, I'm not going to break a bunch of other things. That's part of what needs to be considered in the decision process, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so the decision to buy is made at that emotional level, but it is it always has to be rationalized intellectually. So the good salesperson, the ethical salesperson, will not let someone buy in the heat of emotion. It, they'll slow them down to say, okay, let's talk about the money. Do you have the budget? Where are you going to get the budget? Mm. What's the best timing for this purchase for you? Okay. Um, how, if you need to finance it, what are the different ways that you could get financing? Mm -hmm. Let's Let's talk it through because... And this is what I teach people to say out loud. We need to talk about the budget and your decision process because I want you to make the best possible decision, whether it's to buy or not to buy. To buy. So let's make sure you've considered everything. Wow. 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 Thank you so much for that. Yes. Wow, that is that. I don't think I've had that experience before. Um, when I'm being sold something, <laughs> there's always that pressure buy now, buy now, buy now, or right. you not get it anymore, it's gone. <laughs> Fear of missing out. Oh, if you don't get it today, it's gonna, yeah, price it. is gonna go up, <laughs> they'll be sold out. Yeah, that's preying on your emotions, right? Okay. Mm. Thank you so much. I've learned a lot, actually. Excellent. <laughs> From our Excellent. chat. I've really learned a lot. So in, in addition to your expertise, you mm. are also a fine artist who paints as a form of worship. Um, yes. You want to tell us a little bit more? <laughs> yeah, sure. So um, I... I realized about 15 years ago yeah. that um, I would see things in my mind's eye mm -hmm. and know them mm -hmm. and then have to describe them with words. Wow. And so on the one hand, I had been painting. I, I love doing uh, nature, scenes, birds, landscapes, trees, flowers. Mm -hmm. And so I realized when it came to the, the spiritual realm and, and connecting with God yeah. and, and getting revelation from him, that yeah. it would always come in pictures. And I thought, well, what if I tried to paint? What if I just uh, submit to his will and say, okay, what are what are we making visible today? What do you, what's going on in the spiritual realm that you want made visible? And so I will stand in front of a congregation at church with a blank canvas, and as worship starts, I start to paint, and I'm painting what I'm inspired to do as the worship takes place. Oh, wow, that's interesting. So the paintings that you see behind me, mm -hmm. can you still see them? Are you able to see them? I can see all your paintings at the back of you. Yeah, exactly. So um, 
they were all done in front of a congregation. And I literally didn't know what I was painting until I started and it evolved and then it was done. And each one has a story behind it, um, a significance. Many of them have specific scripture passages that support them. Um, so it's it's a it's a highly creative process. Mm. And what I love about it is taking something that no one else can see and then making it tangible, visible. Mm. Mm. And Shola, what I realized was that it's the same thing I do when I coach and train. Okay. So the the people that I work with and the business that they have is like the blank canvas. And as I listen to them and I hear what they've been able to do, what they're successful at, what they're good at. Yeah. And then I listen for the gaps and I hear the missing pieces. Oh, then yeah. I know what to teach them. I know how to teach them yeah. to fill in the whole picture for them so that they are operating at 100%. Wow. Okay. So, yeah. It, the, the skills are just being applied in two different mediums. Yeah. On a physical canvas with paint or on a people business canvas with business content, if you will. Wow. Wow. So that's um, into, you know, it, you're using both skills, but in different ways. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. It was wow. quite the discovery when I realized that it's like, ah. Oh, there's a connection. <laughs> it's like transferable skills, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. wow. So thank you so much for answering those questions as honestly as you can. We really appreciate all the tips and all the advice. But yes. we have <laughs> We'll ask you for tips on how to sell like Jesus. So um, the first tip is to take an inventory of your sales process. Okay. So Jesus was very methodical at what he did and how he did it. Right. When we sell, we need to follow a process, not not be not to be a pain in the neck about process, mm -hmm. but because it works, it works to get the best result. Yeah. And a couple of things in that process that most people are not doing naturally yeah. include setting expectations at the beginning of the sales conversation yeah. and then setting expectations again at the end if the deal hasn't been done. Mm -hmm. even if it has now you're talking about what are the expectations for next steps for delivery if you will so that setting expectations piece is another way to build trust right um to help people feel comfortable that they know what's coming mm. and they know what to expect and it really does help to eliminate misunderstandings because have you ever hung up the phone or gotten out of a meeting and you thought you knew what you were supposed to do and you delivered it and the person said, this isn't what I asked for. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Because yes. the clarification wasn't done at the end, getting the buy-in to make sure everybody was on the same page, right? Same page, yeah. So that's part of the process that people tend to skip. And the other, I mentioned a little while ago, very quickly, the three parts of qualifying. It's what's the problem that you're solving? What's the budget? And what is the decision process that the person or people will follow? Mm -hmm. It's very important to ask questions around all three of those topics. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Or you can honestly say that you have fully qualified 
someone. Someone. Wow. Wow. Thank you. So here's where most people get off track. Mm -hmm. Someone comes along and says, how much does it cost? Yes. And the tendency is, oh, I want to answer the question because good boys and girls. I want to sell. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, they're interested. Okay. Mm -hmm. No. That question is just the starter question. It, there are a whole bunch of things behind that question that they haven't articulated. Right. So we're going to use that structure that I talked about earlier yes. and say, we will definitely talk about the price. Before we do, would it be okay if I asked you a few questions just to make sure that we're both on the same page, that this is really going to be a good fit for you? Is that all right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So now I've slowed them down because budget is the second step of qualifying, not the first one. So I'm saying we're going to get to that. But first, let's see what the problem is that we're trying to attack. And let's make sure you have you really have the problem that I have the solution for. We got to see, does it fit? And if not, it really doesn't matter how much it costs. Because it's not the right solution. Not the right solution for that customer. That's true. Wow. Wow. Very interesting. So honestly, you've really talked us through how we can sell like Jesus (laughs) without the selling. (laughs) There you go. It really is without the selling, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Without the selling that we know. So uh, for people like us that want to contact you, uh, perhaps, you know, want to know more about you, more about your book or purchase your book or more about your teaching program or coaching program, how can we contact you? So uh, best thing, if you want to investigate on your own is to go to debbrownsales.com. My book is for sale through Amazon, both Kindle and paperback. Okay. And I invite people to send me an email if you're if you're ready to have a conversation because I love having conversations <laughs> as with here. Um, feel free to email me at deb at debbrownsales.com. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And all that information will be in the description and the show notes Perfect. as well. Any inspirational advice for our viewers? I would say, if you're in business for yourself, Mm -hmm. you owe it to yourself to come to terms with selling, whether you do that by getting my book and reading it Mm -hmm. or some other way, it doesn't matter, but I do encourage you to come to terms with selling, that it can be a joyful experience. It can be viewed as helping others. Mm -hmm. And it's not about manipulating people into buying from you. Because once you're at peace with selling, you'll be able to stay in business. I'm in my 15th year of my consultancy. So I use the very strategies that I teach others to use. Mm -hmm. So It does work, and I have many testimonials on my website, so you can see what other people have said as well. Wow. Interesting. Thank you so much (laughs) for coming on our show today and teaching us how to sell like Jesus, like we said, without the selling, without all the ad tactics of selling. And as we know, (laughs) with sales consultants, (laughs) <laughs> have to sell it sometimes at the end of the day your head goes spinning because you've done a lot of hard work trying to convince people to buy but with your technique and strategy it is actually a subtle way of making people buy but from their own perspective and giving them a voice actually to right. make that's exactly it it's giving them the voice to come forward to buy because you've set the stage for them to want to. Yeah, 
<laughs> Thank you so much. Interesting. Now you've convinced me I have to go read that book. <laughs> okay. Excellent. Thank you so much, Shola. This has been a joy. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on our show today. And until next time, it's Shola and Deb on Mission to Inspire. We hope we've really inspired you to sell like Jesus. Thank you, Deb. <laughs> Thank you, Shola. <laughs> Bye. Bye -bye. Thank you for joining us today on Mission to Inspire. Subscribe if you have not already done so. Like, comment, leave a message. Let's stay connected. Let's jointly inspire the world.